It's The Real News. I'm Aaron Maté. Today is the anniversary of the Paris Massacre of 1961. On October 17th, up to 300 French Algerians were killed when French authorities attacked a large protest in support of the Algerian Revolution. Thousands of protesters were then forcibly driven into detention camps where they were beaten and deprived of food. The massacre is being commemorated as the racist legacy of the Algerian war is very much alive in France. Just recently, French lawmakers quietly approved a measure that makes sweeping measures under a two-year emergency law permanent. Yasser Louati is a French human rights and civil liberties advocate. Welcome, Yasser. Uh, good to talk to you today on this anniversary. Can you talk about what happened back then in 1961 and then trace it to what we're seeing in France today? Well, in 1961, we were nearing the end of the uh, Algerian war and the uh, decolonial struggle that was taking place, you know, in that, you know, French colony of North Africa. Uh, so, you know, in the night of, the, uh, of October 17th, the Algerian marchers were demonstrating actually not directly against the ongoing war, but against a discriminatory curfew, which was only applied against, quote unquote, Muslim workers, which was the term for Algerian workers who were in non-French soil in Europe. The orders was that to, uh, to hold them and keep them from marching both from the Beaulieu or the uh, outside the, uh, um, the suburbs of Paris into Paris and from within Paris. The orders were given by a person called Maurice Papon. Maurice Papon was, at that time, the prefect of Paris, who is the head of the police. That person, Maurice Papon, was already a person who had collaborated with the Nazis and had contributed to the de deportation of Jews during uh, the occupation of France. And this spells a lot of, what can I say? shame for the country because instead of dismissing the people who worked with the Nazis and contributed to the deportation of Jews, here you have these high-ranking government officials remaining in office and given highly uh, or highly sensitive positions like the, uh, the, the prefect of Paris. So Maurice Papon gives the clear order that you have to crush the demonstrators. They are, you know, of course, the accusation was that they will, be, uh, uh, they will be armed and they will be shooting on civilians in downtown Paris. Nothing of that happened, but in return what happened is that the police, which found itself outnumbered by the peaceful marchers, uh, panicked and called for more troops. Orders were given to shoot on the, uh, uh, directly at the crowd. Some of them were thrown uh, um, uh, into the, the, the Seine River. Others were taken in, in buses into the uh, police building to be uh, uh, shot in, in cold blood by the police. And others were taken into the uh, Pierre de Coubertin Stadium in Paris. So that massacre basically uh, was supposed to be a shock, but you know, it only um, demonstrated on French soil what was happening in Algeria and in other uh, French colonies. And to prove that it was not an accident or that things got out of hand, another massacre took place a few months later in the subway station of Sharon, and several people again were killed by the police. So that event actually went forgotten. Nobody spoke about it, and France entered into voluntary amnesia about the event. It took three decades for anti-racist advocates and researchers to bring back that event into the limelight and to bring the debate on the recognition of the French state of you know, this you know, state-sponsored crime. And to this day, nearly 60 years afterwards, we are still debating whether or not the event should be recognized. So, François Hollande, when he was president uh, up until a few months ago, recognized the quote-unquote uh, bloody repression of pacifist marchers, but to tell you that, it, or to show that he did not uh, teach France and its elites any lessons, the same person, François Hollande, who was recognizing the bloody repression is a, is a person who called for the state of emergency and to making it permanent, even if it means changing the constitution, and even called for stripping of their citizenship 
you know, uh, so-called radicals convicted of terrorism. Of yeah, course, so, so let's last year's, so, so let's talk about that. The current state of emergency, uh, it, the latest iteration was uh, passed in, was enacted in 2015 after the November attacks in Paris. Recently, though, uh, it was quietly made permanent, or at least several facets of it were made permanent. Can you explain what that means? Actually, you know, the set of emergency gave, again, tremendous power to the police, most notably the capacity to arrest any person, to, to uh, raid their homes, their businesses, to tap their phones, or mere suspicion. You no longer have to go before court to do that. You just have to issue an administrative order. So far, within two years, that meant uh, over 6,000 homes have been raided, mostly against Muslims, as testified by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and many uh, other human rights organizations. But that law is no longer, um, or, or those measures are no longer exceptional. Now they are part of the common law, which means now for the immediately, starting you know uh, 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 one week ago the police can raid people's homes on mere suspicion and the change in comparison to the first version of the state of emergency that was applied in the 1950s is that uh, the french state went from uh, attacking uh, dangerous behaviors to reasons to believe there is suspicious behavior and that's where the problem lies because now the police can arrest any person because of their look because of their assumed religion and the list goes on and that's why when people say we are living under a police state if you combine all the extreme anti-terrorist measures that have been passed in the past 20 years including the law authorizing mass surveillance of the internet phones and any means of communication you know you no longer have the right for privacy you no longer have the right to be at least declared innocent unless you are proved guilty. And those measures were passed on a racist discourse, so much so that 80% of French public opinion are, so are in favor of those measures. But of course, if the state is telling public opinion, don't worry, it will only apply to blacks, Arabs, and Muslims, you don't have to feel you know, afraid of those measures. Well, public opinion says, well, we have been you know, attacked forgetting that Muslims have been attacked as well, and Muslims have been killed as well in the various terrorist attacks. And nobody wants to put those measures in the face of reality that none of them have prevented the past terrorist attacks. The most notorious one of them is, is being, of course, the Bastille Day attack of last year. It can be difficult to understand the extent to which uh, racism has been mainstreamed and uh, racist policies have been so widely accepted. As you say, 80% of the population supports these measures. So can you explain how that's come to be, where attitudes like that are very widespread from the, the political class on down? Well, the previous administration, in order to make these laws acceptable, were speaking, quote unquote, about the enemy within. And that enemy within was, of course, in the same sentence or in the same discourse, somehow a, practice, a practicing Muslim or a dissenting Muslim or a person who does not fit or does not uh, um, go, uh, go along the dominant discourse. And in the, in the implementation of the set of emergency was against Muslim homes, was against mosques, and now every single time French elites speak about radicalization, they only speak about practicing Muslims. And even uh, some prefects in France have agreed on multiple occasions that they were targeting Muslim visibility. The, 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 the word radicalization, for example, is never applied to white supremacist groups that go and get you know, military training in Ukraine or others who go join the Israeli army. It is solely against Muslims. And then when you have the capacity for the state to shut down any place of assembly and those places of assembly that were, that were shut down are only mosques. It is never, for example, neo-Nazi assemblies. It is never, for example, churches calling for the, the, um, the overthrowing of the French Republic. It is solely against Muslims. And when you have various organizations uh, uh, um, numbering the attacks against Muslim homes and that the French government says, so what, we have to do something, you see that the first victims of these extreme measures were predominantly Muslims, 
but in order to justify otherwise unacceptable measures, you have to tell public opinion, you know what, we are going against these radical Muslims. The problem is that radical Muslim has, first, radical has never been defined, and radical Muslim goes from an Al-Qaeda-like uh, character to a Muslim woman wearing a headscarf or a person going to the mosque or, or fasting Ramadan. Or uh, wearing a uh, burqa type bathing suit, right? When the when the burqa uh, the burkinis, as they were called, were even banned in a couple exactly. of, of French towns. So, so yeah. So let me ask you, as an activist who is uh, opposing all these measures and opposing this mentality, what are the challenges for you in a country where, as you say, you you're coming up against a, a large segment of the population, eighty percent in some cases, that support uh, these kinds of um, measures against Muslims? Well, we are facing this similar, you know, with all due respect to proportion and to, to what happened in the past, every single minority in France faced similar odds. Hmm. The, the Jews, the Protestants, the Spanish fleeing the, civil, the, uh, the Spanish Civil War, and the Italian workers, etc. They all went through it. Unfortunately, that's the French school of integration. You have to go through these kind of events. But now the biggest challenge is not to confront the French state at home. It's a lost battle. Now we have to go through international institutions and expose the abuses of the French state where, in the same places where the French government goes and lectures other, other countries on the human rights and the rule of law. Because these two uh, things are gone. You can no longer speak about the rule of law in France where the police can arrest any person without going before court. And you can no longer, no longer speak about basic human rights when minorities are asked to remain or to become invisible. And that's our objective right now is to go through the UN, the European Commission, the European Parliament, the OSCE, and every single international platform to confront the French state, trying to go after the mainstream media is also a big challenge, and that's why there is a push for alternative media to emerge. For example, we have a, a new one called lemuslimpost.com, on which I do, I do contribute. But you also have various people pushing for new uh, faces to, uh, to take part in public discourse. This battle is going to take a generation of two. Make no mistake about it. Hmm. Always encouraging to hear about the emergence of alternative media um, anywhere. And uh, Yasser, we thank you for telling us about it. Yasser Louati, French human rights activist, thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on The Realm of